Um, wait a minute. This isn't my room. Well, anyway, hello everybody. Today I thought I'd do something special after Bubble Month. That's right. I'm talking about Spyro. He's been flying green dragons and collecting gems for 25 years. But today I'm only going to be covering the three games on PS1. So if you wanted me to cover stuff like Enter the Dragonfly or the Legend of Spyro games, then sadly I won't be covering those for now. But enough of that, on to the first game. Ted Price, who created Insomnia Games, was resolved to work in the video game industry ever since the Atari 2600 was released in 1977, when he was just 9 years old. Funnily enough, Spyro is Insomniac's second attempt at a game, the first one being Disruptor. Even though Disruptor bombed commercially, its favorable critical reception impressed Universal Interactive Studios, motivating the team to move forward with their next project. Insomniac artist Craig Stitt proposed the concept of a game featuring a dragon since he was personally interested in the fabled animal. At first, the tone of the game was much darker and more realistic. According to Insomniac's COO, John Fiorito, who joined the company in 1997 during the development of Spyro, inspiration for the game came in part from the movie Dragonheart, and the game started out as a realistic and kind of dark and gritty before turning more whimsical and lighthearted. But you wanna know why it changed to? Well, it was thanks to a suggestion by Mark Cerny, who suggested to make a game with greater mass market appeal as the PlayStation's user base was declining and the PlayStation's library of friendly games were far exceeded to the Nintendo 64's. Spyro was originally intended to be called Pete, but the name was dropped due to fear of copyright issues over resemblances to the Disney movie Pete's Dragon. Spyro was a possibility, but it was ultimately rejected as being too mature, so they opted on Spyro. Spyro was originally going to be green, but the designers changed him to purple because they were concerned he would blend in with the grass. Naughty Dog, the studio behind Grass Bandicoot, and Insomniac had a tight working relationship when creating Spyro because of their shared office space in proximity to one another. The two game developers frequently collaborated playing early iterations of one another's games and eventually sharing game technology. As a result, Spyro contained the demo for Crash Bandicoot Warped and vice versa. Fun! Well before we go on to the actual game, I'd like to quickly sidetrack to the Crash 3 demo. First you get a teaser of what, what was to come at the time. Then you're placed into the only level you can play in this demo, a Krokojetski level. Interesting thing to know here is that this is actually an earlier version of Crash 3, meaning there are a few minor differences. Who knows, I might actually cover the Crash Bandicoot trilogy, but not right now. So our story begins during an interview with the Artisan Dragons, where after insulting Nasty Nork, an enraged Nasty Nork encases the dragons into crystal shaped dragons. Seemingly being the only one unaffected by this, it is up to Spyro and Sparks to save the day. The most simple of simple story. So unlike Kras, not only does Spyro have a hubble, but the levels are open ended as open-ended as the PS1 could handle anyway. You can press X to jump, you can press it again to glide, you can press O to 
fire flames and you can press press square to jump in all honesty charging feels a little too clunky for my liking what you will be collecting are gems dragon eggs stolen by those darn egg thieves but the main thing you'll be doing are rescuing crystallized dragons when you do they thank you for it some will give you hints some will chit chat will spiral a little bit but that's pretty much it and i swear to god if i hear thank you for releasing me one more time i'm gonna ah never mind you don't really get anything for collecting the eggs which while making it feel redundant at least makes it satisfying to charge it to the eggs team yeah take that you freaking jerk nasty norks are the primary enemies in this game but you meet some other ones, some that are so big you can't really charge into them, forcing you to use fire on them. Some who wear metal, thus forcing you to charge into them. But I really dislike the big enemies, how they can just stab it. But if there's one thing I gotta praise, is the graphics. For the time, this must have been a very colorful game. Arguably even more colorful than the first Crash Bandicoot game. The worlds you explore look pretty and gorgeous, and it's really impressive that this was managed to be done on PS1. But at the same time, some of the dragons look odd, like really odd, like pinatas. Your health is indicated by the colors of sparks. Yellow is full, green is when you've been hit once, blue is near death, and once you get hit again, you're left vulnerable because he's no longer there. Once you get hit while he's no longer there, then you die. However, if you want to replenish your health, you gotta burn down some smaller enemies to gain a butterfly that sparks can then eat, don't question anything. But as long as Sparks is full health, he can help you collect collectibles, which is really neat. The flying stages in this game are pretty fun. You essentially have to destroy a certain amount of objects before the time runs out. And it's always fun trying to get the best time. I just wonder why he can fly in those stages but not the regular ones. Right, right, don't question anything. Wait, the bosses? Yeah, apparently they are. And honestly, they are the weakest parts. Being pitifully easy to defeat. Making the Mario bosses look like Dark Souls. I don't know how I've gone this far without mentioning the music, but it is so good. Being composed by Stuart Copeland means we get a lot of atmospherically, catchily, headbanging music. And honestly, I really, really dig it. So in conclusion, I'd say that this game, while not really aging the best in some areas, has aged better than the first Crash Bandicoot game. But honestly, I think it's best if you stick with the Reunited Trilogy version. Back in 2018, the Purple Dragon finally returned with a remake of the trilogy, similar to how the Unseen trilogy did the time being made by Toys for Bob. And there are some changes that are done for the better, like adding the skill points from the later games, having Tom Kenny voice him here, which as much as I love Carlos Alas Racky, Tom Kenny definitely suits Spyro better. But wow, the reunited trilogy looks so gorgeous. Except for the occasional moments where it drops frames, this game looks beautiful. And it's the little things too, like making the controls feel a lot more smoother, giving the dragons fun character designs, and overall being a better version of the first game, this is definitely the version I'd recommend you try. Alright, one game down and two more to go, next time I'll see you Spyro 2. <laughs> Who's Ripto?